Sisters and brothers, good morning. If I'd known that that was a song that was going to be sung today, I probably would not have bothered to preach because that song in itself is the message. But I want to ask you this morning, are you my neighbor? Are you my neighbor? And how many of us really know who our neighbors are? How many of us know the persons who live beside us? How many of us know the persons who are sitting at a good distance away from us this morning by name? How many of us know their birthdays and anniversaries and the children's name? For those of us over the Zoom platform, can you identify the other person who's on the platform? Do you know them by name? Do you know where they live? Have you ever been to their house? Have you ever been over for a barbecue? And I know we'll say, but Rev, we're in the middle of a pandemic, but there was a time before the pandemic. So I'm asking you now, are you my neighbor? Are you a neighbor to the person who is beside you either in the sanctuary or on this virtual space? Have you ever socialized with them outside of Sunday morning? Having just heard just a little bit about me, do you know me? Having seen my bio for those who had a chance to read it, would you consider me to be your neighbor? Let us pray. Speak now eternal God. Your children listen for a word from you, a word of healing, a word of hope, a word mighty God for this difficult time that we face. So speak through me to your children, O God, and may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen and amen. The text for us today that was read for us today took us to a point when the people of God were, who called themselves Christians were facing a very difficult time. The author who we believe to be Luke the physician intention was to present Jesus as the Messiah, the Lord whose life, death and resurrection made salvation available to all people. It was written to strengthen the faith of the believers all over. This book takes us to the birth of John the Baptist and Jesus. We're taken to young Jesus in the temple and John the Baptist in the wilderness and preaching to, of the one who is to come. We see Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, his rejection by his hometown Nazareth, the calling of his first disciples and performing miracles all over Galilee, the Sermon on the Mount, the teaching of the people, the sending out of his disciples, Peter declaring that Jesus Christ was indeed the Messiah. And we see Jesus predicting his death and transfiguration. Then here we are. The experts of the law wanted to know how to inherit the kingdom of heaven. And I'd want to believe that that is a fair question because many of us now would like to know how do we inherit the kingdom of heaven? He had read all the books of the law so he could answer Jesus. Jesus told him what was in the books and he's answered, love your, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and your entire mind and love your neighbor as yourself. So maybe you're still wrestling with the question whether or not I am your neighbor. Don't feel bad about it because the lawyer in our text was still wrestling with the fact and trying to figure out who is his neighbor, whether it was to test Jesus or whether it was a case that he genuinely wanted to know. He asked Jesus who was his neighbor. Based on dictionary definition, a neighbor is defined as someone who lives next to you. So based on that definition, I, of course, could not be your neighbor because I'm currently in the tropics here in Jamaica. And for some of you, the person who is sitting beside you in the sanctuary or the person who is online with you in the virtual space, by this definition, would not be your neighbor. 
But the Hebrews, they had another definition. Their definition of a neighbor is anyone who was a part of their Jewish tradition. So once you were a part of the community, you were a neighbor. Once you belonged to the gathered people, then you were a neighbor. But you see, I don't like those definitions of a neighbor because those definition of a neighbor restrict so many of us. And based on those definitions, a lot of people would not be our neighbors. So for our purpose this morning, I don't want to limit our definition of a neighbor to those who are part of the gathered community of faith or those who live next door. I want to extend the concept of a neighbor to every human being who is made in the image and likeness of God. They are our neighbor. So what truth lies in the text today as we wrestle with the question, are you my neighbor? The first truth I want to highlight is that if you are my neighbor, then love me. If you are my neighbor, then love me. The line from a popular song says, I want to know what love is, and I want you to show me. I want to feel what love is, and I know you can show me. Yes, this is a very secular song, but if we apply it to the world today, if we apply it to the way how we connect with our neighbors, we'll see value in it. I want to contend that if we are truly neighbors, if every human being is my neighbor, if every human being is your neighbor, then we must love them. The latter part of Luke 10 verse 27 says, and love your neighbor as yourselves. I want you to understand that the love that was mentioned in this verb is not the ordinary type of love. In the original language of the text, it's the agape kind of love. It's that unconditional love that God offers even to you and I today. That immeasurable love that comes only from God. So basically, if you don't have a relationship with God, then you cannot love somebody unconditionally. If you do not know who God is for yourself, then you cannot offer this agape kind of love. This love that must be shared, this love that must be experienced by all people. If you and I are truly neighbors, not just to each other, but to all human beings, then we must love them with unconditional love that comes only from God. We live in a world where it seems like people have forgotten how to love. Arguments have been had over simple misunderstandings. People are being killed because of someone who is hurting, who have never experienced true love and sees violence as a mean of expression. Our young children are going out and seeking love elsewhere because they cannot find it at home. And I dare to say at times they cannot find it in the church. And so they find it in the worst places. They find it among men who say, I love you, but what they really mean is I want your body. Our young boys especially have never really heard the words I love you. And they don't know what it means to experience that kind of love. And so love for them is translated in carrying guns. It's translated in selling drugs and disrespecting people. We have men and women who do not know what it means to be to be have love and who have abandoned their children because no one showed them how to love. And so when they have their own, they still don't know how to love. Women who have been battered and abused by men and society and working hard to care for her family because the man who said he loved her walked out on her and her children. Or men who for her, or new men who love for them is for her and not her children. Men who struggle day and night to raise children on their own, trying to figure out what to do. We live in a society where hate is spewed from politicians. Hate is spewed from different groups. There are tension between the races and the constant echoes of all life matter, Asian life matter, black lives matter, blue lives matter. Hate because of a person's sexual orientation seems to be everywhere. But in the midst of this, you and I, as the people of God, are called to demonstrate that agape kind of love. 
the kind of love that says, listen, I don't care who you are. I don't care where you've been. I don't care of your, your gender and your class and the color of your skin. You are my neighbor and so I love you. We have to get to the place where love becomes a part of who we are. It is a love that does not ask about anybody's past. It is a love that does not ask, what can you do for me? It's a love that is, embraces all people, regardless of where they live, regardless of what they make, regardless of how messed up their lives have been, regardless of who they are, regardless of their political persuasion they have, or the choices that they have made in life, we are called to love them. That agape kind of love that only God can provide. You and I are called to tell some young girls that, listen, I love you, so you don't have to expose yourself like this. To tell some young boys, I love you, so joining the gang is not the right answer. To tell some women, I love you, I see that you're struggling, and so I love you, and this love that I have for you come from God. It does not require you sleeping with me. So men need to hear, I love you, I see you trying hard. And I know it is difficult, but God loves you and I love you too. We have to help some people to understand that love that we have for them, it comes from a place where we're not expecting anything else. So if you are my neighbor, then love me. Love me with an everlasting love. A love that does not require us anything. Let us not get it twisted because sometimes we tell people that we love them and it is just words, it's just lip service. The Samaritan in being a good neighbor, showing love did not just say to the man who was battered and bruised and left for dead, I love you and walked away. Or he did not say to him, I will pray for you and went on his way. He actually did something. We too must show people love by doing things. So if you are my neighbor, then love me. I'm not saying anything is wrong with prayer, but as a church, we have to move from the place from just saying, I will pray for you to actually doing something. This man was battered and a bruise and left for dead. And the Samaritan in his love decided to do something, not pray that somebody else would come. I want you to know that the Levi and the priest, based on our Hebrew definition of a neighbor, was a neighbor to this man, but somewhere along the line, they did not have enough love for him. And so they passed on by. If you are my neighbor, then love me. If you are neighbors to those who are helpless and battered and abused in society, who have been left for dead in so many different ways, emotionally, spiritually, financially, and health-wise, then love them. Even though it seems like it's difficult to love because we're so far apart and we've been called to social distance, but love requires a little bit more than actually embracing somebody. It requires doing something. So if you are my neighbor, then love me. The second truth I want to share with you today is if you are my neighbor, then see me. If you are my neighbor, then see me. And to see is to visually perceive something. Verse 31 to 33 of the text says that priest happens to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So to a Levi, and when he came to the place and saw him, he passed on the other side. They were technically his neighbor based on the fact that this man was a Jew. But then a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to the place where the man was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. All three men saw that the man was battered and abused and near to death, left for dead. And all three discerned that he needed help, but only one responded. I want you to understand that we have to get to the place where we see people for who they are and what they are. We have to get to the place that we say that we love them. And that means that we not only love them, but we see them. Not just visually, 
perceive them with our natural eyes, but discern who they are, discern what they need from us. You have to be able to see your neighbor, see that your neighbor is hurting, see that your neighbor feels helpless and lost and alone. You must be able to see that there is something wrong. You must be able to feel it in your spirit when your brother, your sister seems to not be on the right path. You must be able to perceive that your neighbor, to see that your neighbor is not okay. We live in a time where, especially during this pandemic, where mental health seems to be, mental health challenges seems to be on the rise. And there are people who are feeling depressed lost and alone and but on social media they're bright and happy but we have to get back to the place of discernment when we can tell even when they're smiling that something is wrong here in jamaica to tell you about the women and men of zion who would know that there is something wrong and would come together as a church to pray and if it means praying all night, then they're willing to pray all night because there's something wrong going on in their society. I want you to understand that there is something going on wrong in not just Jamaica, but in Chicago where you are. The endless acts of crime and violence is something that the church must see. The killing of our young men is something that the church must see and become uncomfortable about. The killing of police officers is something that we must become uncomfortable about. The fact that people aren't allowed to have their freedom to just be alive and the color of their skin is causing problem for them is something that we as a people must see. If you are my neighbor, if you are the neighbor of those who live in your community, then you must see them. It's not enough to just say, I see what's going on and leave it there. But can you see them? Can you see the people around you? Or maybe it's a case that they don't look like you, they don't speak like you, they don't go to the, they didn't go to the same schools that you did. They are not rich and their social and economic standing in society is not high and they are strangers to you. So you don't care and they are not your neighbors. But I want you today to see the strangers in your midst the heartbroken, the torn, the battered, the helpless, the confused. If you don't see them, I ask you to open your eyes. If you are my neighbor, see me. See when I'm battered and worn and torn. See when I just need a word of encouragement. See when you need to understand that there is something going on and I need some help. You have, to, we have to be our brothers and sisters keeper. One songwriter, hymn writer says, brother, sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you. We have to get to the place where we see each other brick by brick building back what the enemy seemed to have stolen from us. So are you my neighbor? Then see me. The final thing I want to leave with us tonight, this morning, is are you my neighbor, then protect me. Are you my neighbor, then protect me. And to pro a protection means to give, to keep someone from harm. So if you are my neighbor, then protect me from harm. The text in verse 35 says, the next day he took two denaries and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. I want you to understand that the man could have said, I've done enough. I took him to a place of safety. I've gotten him into a place where he can receive some help. But as his neighbor, he was willing to go a little bit further and say, hey, take two denaries, which is literally two days pay, and ask the innkeeper to take care of him. And if there is any more money that is required, when I come back, I'll pay you. You see, we're called to protect those who cannot protect themselves. For many of us, our ancestors have been wrong centuries ago. And songs like By the Rivers Have Babylon, where we sat down and there we wept when we remember Zion, still resonates in our soul. There hardly anyone there to protect them from hardship. But here we are today, 
some of us having the privilege and position to help those who are suffering, to help those who have had traumatic experiences. Today, we're called to stand in the gap for children, women, and men, young people who have been abused, families that are being separated, families that are being torn apart by gun violence and gang activities, families who, because of their ethnic background, have been the target for so many hate and crimes against them. Are you my neighbor then protect me? We have to get to the place where protection does not mean only sitting in meetings and coming up with good plans and it ends on paper. If you are my neighbor, then protect me. And sometimes protection means getting up to demonstrate and demand that better be done for those who are less in society. Sometimes protecting me means that we have to go beyond just committees and meetings and actually doing the work of the one who has called us. Sometimes protection means being that voice for the voiceless, using our privilege to speak out about injustices, using our privilege, using our position of power, whether it is because of educational level or because of your status in society, to petition those who are leaders of your country to say, hey, enough is enough. We're tired of the bloodshed. We're tired of our young men's lives being cut down. We're tired of our children and going missing. We're tired of our civil servants being killed. Enough is enough. Are you my neighbor? Then protect me. Never forget those who have lost their lives because of senseless killing. Whether it is by the police or by gang activities or domestic abuse, whatever it is, enough is enough. And as a church who have the privilege and the power and authority to speak out about these injustices, you and I are charged to be neighbors, to be able to stand up and say enough is enough. We have the privilege and power and authority to stand up and say we are tired of the blood and as a church, we're going beyond just committee and meetings and book clubs and getting to the place where we become active in protecting our nation, in protecting those who are without help, in protecting our children, our young people, our men and our women. If you are my neighbor, then protect me. As Christians, we're tasked with this responsibility of being each other's neighbor. We've come to the end and you've reflected, maybe you can easily draw the conclusion that indeed I am your neighbor because we are. I was made in the image and likeness of God. Indeed, the people you don't know are your neighbors because they're made in the image and likeness of God. And we have a responsibility to love them with an unconditional kind of love. We have a responsibility to see when they're hurting, to see when they're battered and bruised, to see when they feel defeated and do something. If you are my neighbor and every single person we're neighbors together, then you have a responsibility to protect me, even as I try to protect you. So are you my neighbor? Am I your neighbor? Are the children and young people and men and women in Chicago and Illinois and the United States of America and this world as it is, are they your neighbor? So love them, see them and protect them. I invite you to think on these things in the name of our parenting God, God the Son and God the Blessed Holy Spirit. Amen, amen, and amen. Mm -hmm.